Nosferatu, the undead. The race of the vampire were driven from Egypt. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel, where I cover vampires, werewolves, and other supernatural creatures. In this video, we're going to be looking at the cult classic and gem of a movie, Vampire in Brooklyn, from 1995, starring Eddie Murphy, who is also the producer and co-writer. The director of this film is Wes Craven, known for his many classic movies such as Hills Have Eyes, Scream, Nightmare on Elm Street, and many more. Something I noticed was a lot of his movies blend comedy and horror, and this movie is no different. This film is about an ancient vampire that travels to Brooklyn to find the last of his kind, and a detective who learns that her mother's mysterious death in a mental asylum and this vampire are somehow connected. But probably not how you think. If you enjoy videos about vampires, werewolves, and other supernatural creatures, leave a like and subscribe for new videos every week. The movie begins with some shots of Brooklyn and a bit of an exposition dump from the vampire. He says a long time ago, the Nosferatu, the undead, the vampire people were driven from Egypt by vampire hunters. Most vampires fled to the Carpathian Mountains, better known as Transylvania. Other vampires with better taste, such as himself, fled south through Africa and over the Atlantic Ocean to a hidden island deep in the Bermuda Triangle. There they lived for centuries, feeding on the blood of travelers. This alludes to the idea that all the mysterious happenings in the Bermuda Triangle, like boats and planes going missing, was being caused by vampires. Also, if these vampires were alive in ancient Egypt, this would make them roughly 5,000 years old. After a few centuries in the Bermuda Triangle, they were once again found by the hunters. This time, all the vampires were killed. Except one. This is Maximilian. Although he escaped, he says that a vampire alone is a vampire doomed. His only hope is to find the one offspring from his tribe that was born in a foreign land. If he's going through this much trouble to find her, it must be very difficult to create a new vampire. Max managed to escape with his coffin on a ship traveling to Brooklyn. This one shot of the ship looks like PS2 graphics. The ship arrives in the Brooklyn Harbor but then starts smashing through all the boats and docks. Max must have killed everyone on board shortly before arriving. This kind of reminds me of Dracula from the original movie, how he took the Demeter and then killed everyone on the ship shortly before arriving to London. The ship cruises all the way up and smashes through the window right behind these guys, but how would you not hear this ship literally smashing the entire harbor to smithereens? The two characters in the boathouse are Julius Jones and his uncle, who will be very important characters throughout the movie. Who the hell's patting this vessel? Stevie the wonder! They board the ship to see if anybody's alive and find that the entire crew has been murdered. After finding the entire crew dead, he tries to leave the boat, but a giant wolf appears. <laughs> Lucky for him, the vampire's probably already had his fill of blood and leaves the ship. After exiting the ship, the man sees the shadow of the wolf turn into a man. This is when the tone of the movie abruptly ships into a comedy and we see Julius being thrown out of his apartment. To be honest, I think this scene kind of takes away from the movie a bit and it would have been better to just continue on with the creepy theme right until when Maximilian shows up. After being thrown out, Julius Jones starts being chased by some Italian mobsters because he owes them money. They chase him down this alleyway and hit him with their car. Just when things were looking bad for Julius, Maximilian shows up. The mobsters shoot Maximilian multiple times, but he just gets back up. He applauds them for their aim, and we see the bullet wounds heal right in front of our eyes. And his suit also heals. This is when Max rips the gangster's heart out like Lloyd Christmas from Dumb and Dumber. The other gangster runs away, and Maximilian flies through the air over to him. We don't get to see exactly what he does to this guy, but we do see him rip off his body parts and start throwing them away. Julius, obviously terrified of what he just saw, runs away to a nearby warehouse to hide. He pulls out a smoke to try to calm his nerves, but Maximilian comes smashing through the window. He immediately produces a flame from his hand, trying to light a smoke for him. So that shows us these vampires have pyrokinesis. Julius tries to run away, but Max instantly reappears, showing us that he also has super speed or outright teleportation. The end result of this encounter is Maximilian giving some of his blood to Julius. This doesn't turn him into a vampire though. Instead, it turns him into a ghoul. He says that he will have many abilities of the vampire, but will still be able to go out in the day. Because he's going to be Max's servant. 
Max's blood must also help in controlling Julius, because after he gives him his blood, he seems to willingly go along with anything that he says. He explains that the reason that he turns Julius into a ghoul was because he saw him down at the docks, stealing and being a thief, and he thought this would make him a perfect candidate. This is when Max informs Julius of his plan. He's trying to find a girl, the last of his kind. But we also learn something else that's important. She's a half vampire, and she doesn't even know it. Also, for some reason, he says that he has to find her before the next full moon. It's not clear exactly why he needs to, but it seems very important. This is when we first meet Rita Vetter. This is the woman that Max is looking for. We learn later that her mother was some kind of supernatural researcher. She traveled to the islands in the Bermuda Triangle to study the vampires. She did a lot more than study them though. She ended up falling in love with one, and that's how she became pregnant with Rita. At some point, she traveled back to Brooklyn and had Rita. Rita has no knowledge of her father or the fact that she's a half vampire. She also has no idea what recently drove her mother insane. Sometime after returning from Bermuda, she began to lose her mind, and this led to her being institutionalized and eventually taking her own life. This all happens shortly before the events of the movie. Rita is a Brooklyn police officer, and she is sent to investigate the dead bodies on the boat. While looking through the boat, she ends up finding Max's coffin. She opens up the coffin and sees a woman inside. This is her mother. We don't know much about her mother at this point in the movie or what she looks like, so this scene was a little confusing to me initially. I thought maybe this was another vampire that Max didn't know about. But no, it's a hallucination of Rita's mother. Something very important about Rita is that she can see things. She's sensitive, almost like a spirit medium. She has strange dreams and paints the things that she sees, and these things end up happening in the real world. While Rita is in the ship, Max returns to get his coffin and sees Rita. When he does, he says, It's you. So he was able to instantly recognize that she was a half vampire. Max suddenly vanishes, and so does his coffin. Rita tries to quickly bring her partner, named Justice, to see the coffin. But when she does, it's not there, making her feel crazy. We learn that she's taken the death of her mother pretty hard, so her partner is worried that she might actually be losing her mind. We now go back to Max, and he's trying to find a place to put his coffin. It turns out that Julius's uncle is a landlord of an apartment building, so he gets him a room there. We also see that Julius's ear has fallen off. This is one of the side effects of being a ghoul. His body begins to slowly rot. I feel like the side effects of being a ghoul are a little worse than Max let on. Julius's uncle, named Silas, is a little reluctant to rent him a room, until Max throws him a small bag of gold coins. It's hard to tell what's on these coins, but maybe they're from Egypt. When we first see the apartment, it's very dirty and dingy, but later it looks like a luxury mansion. Max says that he had to cast every spell that he knew on the apartment to make it presentable. So similar to Dracula, he has supernatural abilities but can also use spells like a sorcerer. Max informs Julius that he wants to find the girl tonight. It's very important that he finds her before the next full moon. Rita then has a pretty cool horror sequence. She hears something mysterious and runs to her apartment door, fumbling with her keys. Once inside, she breathes a sigh of relief, only for something to start smashing on the door. She tries to grab for her gun, but it's not there. She runs to the elevator door and begins spamming the button. The door is being smashed apart by something, and when the elevator door opens, she sees her mother again. She looks all creepy and reaches out for Rita, and then she wakes up. Turns out this was all a dream. She often has nightmares like this, and I wonder if it's her mother trying to warn her. The next day, Julius is told to follow Rita and try and get information about her. He's dressed up in this comically bad fake beard, pretending to be a janitor. He finds out that she'll be going to a club tonight to follow up on a lead about the killings on the boat. I guess ghouls have an inclination to eat bugs, because he reaches down and eats a cockroach off the desk. I wonder if this is some kind of reference to Renfield from Dracula, because he was known for eating bugs. The next time we see Julius, he looks much worse. His skin is now grey, and he's beginning to look like a walking corpse. While washing the car, his hand just snaps off, and then he just has one hand for the rest of the movie. Max does say that if he does well, he could make the full transition into a vampire. So that means that ghouls can still become vampires. A lot of people speculate that Billy from Fright Night was a ghoul. He was stronger than a human and a mortal, but not a full vampire. Julius doesn't seem to be any stronger than a human. 
or have any benefits at all. When Max is driving to the club to find Rita, we see a few more of his abilities. Julius turns on some loud music that he doesn't like, and some kind of magical electricity shorts out the radio and hurts Julius. Then he blows out some air, and it shatters the rearview mirror, showing us that he most likely has control over the elements. This might be what allows him to fly. Rita is just now arriving at the club, and inside she meets with someone named Dr. Zeko. He kinda reminds me of Papa Midnight from Constantine. He owns this club and has a lot of knowledge about vampires. Rita and her partner are here because the police couldn't read the ship's logs and apparently he's some kind of expert. He's from an area in Bermuda where the ship came from, so he can read the language. They ask him what the ship's log says, and this is what he tells him. The crew thought there was an evil on board. Their voyage was filled with sickness and nightmares. Sounds like they had an experience like the Demeter from Dracula. And just like Dracula, the captain even left a log behind. Dr. Zeko thought the last of the vampires were dead, but this ship log tells him that at least one survived. He warns them that they are facing something more dangerous than they have ever faced before. A vampire. Vampires have no mercy, no regrets, and he can change shapes. He could be sitting right next to us, and we wouldn't even know it. When Dr. Zeko first sees Rita, he acts like he knows who she is, and what she is. He knew Rita's mother, and he lived on the island where the vampires were. He has a large scar on his face, and he says it was from a vampire trying to take his woman, and the vampire succeeded. Rita listens to the man, but her partner Justice wants nothing to do with this supernatural nonsense. He says they're trying to solve a murder, not start a witch hunt. Max arrives at the club and finds Rita, and uses his charm to sweep her off her feet. Unfortunately, Julius acts very rude and vulgar, which ruins his chances for tonight. In this club, there was a snake on display. When Max is close to the snake, it becomes extremely agitated. The same thing happens with a dog and a cat, so animals must be able to sense that he's a vampire. Max reminds Julius that they are working with limited time, and he needs to turn her as soon as possible. Back at Rita's apartment, her partner Justice sees this painting in her living room. It's a painting of a woman who looks like she's being crucified. Rita's roommate goes outside to try to chat up Justice, but he wants nothing to do with her and leaves. He's secretly in love with Rita. This is when Max arrives. They go back up to the apartment and Rita can hear them getting it on. This makes her think that her partner Justice slept with her roommate, making her very angry. But in actuality, it was her roommate being murdered by Max. Rita decides to go talk to her preacher about the nightmares she's been having. But Max kills the preacher and takes on his appearance. He kills on the preacher and feeds on him in order to do this. So you must have to kill or at least feed on the person in order to look like them. Later, Julius asks if he could show him how to do this. But Max says it's very difficult to take on another's appearance and even harder to assimilate their thoughts. I also like that when he takes on the preacher's appearance, it's not just a different actor with Eddie Murphy's voice dubbed over, it's Eddie Murphy in full makeup playing another character, which he's very good at. When he walks into the church, he begins smoking like he's on fire and has to quickly leave and perform the sermon on the front lawn. Since vampires are harmed by holy objects and places, they must be inherently evil. This reminds me of the scene from Little Nicky where one of Nicky's brothers is pretending to be the Pope and telling people to commit sin. He's basically doing the same thing, but telling people that evil is good. Evil is good! He also takes this opportunity to point out the fact that Rita's partner slept with her roommate, making her even more angry, even though he knows it's not true. But his plan is to isolate Rita from everyone around her, killing her roommate, making her hate her partner. If everyone else is gone, Max will be the only one for her to turn to. You know damn well who? What? Nikki! Ah. The whore Babylon! That's what you were! Max follows Rita to an Italian restaurant to try and meet up with her again. However, when he arrives, he's stuck up by an Italian gangster. Do you recognize this actor? It's actually Eddie Murphy in makeup. I honestly had no idea that that was Eddie Murphy the first time I watched this movie. I can't help but notice that this movie has some similarities with Coming to America. It's kind of like Coming to America but with a vampire. He kills this mobster and takes on his appearance to enter the restaurant. Rita is there to question the Italian mobsters about the killings, 
Max enters and immediately sticks them all up with a gun. I noticed while editing he tells everyone to drop their weapons on the floor and the camera pans down. Look at some of these weapons. There's a scimitar, ninja size, nunchucks, a hammer, some guns, and a bundle of dynamite. These criminals have the same arsenal as a Looney Tunes character. He takes Rita and says he's gonna kidnap her, but before leaving, demands some red wine and an order of facility pasta. Like I said before, animals don't seem to like vampires. The mobster's cat tries to jump at Max, and he kills it. He's now killed a dog and a cat. Whatever happened to leaving the animals out of it? Luckily, Rita attacks Max, and they end up arresting him and taking him to the station. When at the station, Max again uses this opportunity to stir up drama between Rita and her partner, saying that he slept with her roommate. This works extremely well, and she slaps him and leaves. Before being put into a cell, he uses some kind of mind control and tells one of the women in the building to attack a police officer. She does it immediately without question, and this gives Max the opportunity to change back into his normal appearance, and then just leave. Rita's now extremely angry and walking home, so Max follows her. He finds her just in time too, because she's almost hit by a taxi. Why was the taxi going full Tokyo Drift mode though? Maybe he used some kind of mind control to make the taxi driver try to hit her. Max apologizes for their first meeting and says his friend Julius was just drunk. He uses his charm to get Rita to come back to his place for dinner. This is when we get to see that he's completely transformed the apartment. He also pulls out the stolen wine and pasta from earlier, so there was a payoff to that. The two have a great night together, and while dancing, Rita becomes entranced. Max tells her, all you have to do is say the word. And she does, allowing him to turn her into a vampire. She's now begun her transformation from half vampire to full vampire. The next day, Justice is called to a crime scene and sees the dead body of Rita's roommate. This is when he puts the pieces together that it looks exactly like her painting. This is a pretty gruesome kill for a comedy horror written by Eddie Murphy. Rita's partner Justice drives over to her apartment to tell her about her roommate. When he arrives, he finds that she's been sleeping all day and all the blinds in her house are closed. He reveals that the way that she was killed was just like her painting. Rita is in disbelief and says they're just supposed to be dreams. But her partner assures her it's real. She forgives him for the misunderstanding about her roommate and the two finally embrace their feelings for each other. But then Rita almost bites him. Then she sees her reflection in the mirror disappear. I don't know if I mentioned before that these vampires have no reflection. This causes Rita to run away and try and find Max. When she arrives at Max's apartment, with one hit, she sends Julius flying across the room, showing us that she's already gaining vampire abilities. She demands answers and wants to know what's going on, and he tells her that she has been given the gift of eternal life, but she doesn't want it. To try and persuade her, Max finally reveals that he was sent here by her father, and her father was a vampire. He also tells her that his death is what drove Rita's mother insane and to eventually take her own life. The way Max tells the story is that Rita's father sent her away because he knew the hunters were coming for them and wanted her to be safe. He says something important about half vampires too. He says, haven't you ever wondered why you feel things that others don't? Never had a cold, never broke a bone. So half vampires don't have all the same abilities as a full vampire, but they do still have some. Max tries to convince her that she will be much happier as a vampire. Meanwhile, her partner goes to Dr. Zeko for advice on how to help. Justice reveals another painting he found of Rita's, embracing with Max. Zeko says that in order to save Rita, she cannot feed on blood, and Max must be killed before the next full moon. Can I just stop for a second to acknowledge the name, Detective Justice? It's a bit on the nose perhaps, but kind of funny I guess. Zeko gives Justice a special wooden dagger, or stake, to kill the vampire most likely a weapon that he brought from his native island. Justice has to move fast though, because Max is trying to show Rita how to feed on someone, but it terrifies her. Max says they must feed or they will die, but she doesn't want to. Max is beginning to look more monstrous now, showing his true form. Rita resists her bloodlust and runs away, but passes out due to lack of blood. Max finds her and brings her back to his apartment. Not long after Rita is brought back to the apartment, Justice arrives to save the day. Julius squares up to fight Justice and I thought we were gonna get to see if he has super strength, but he just throws a huge kick, 
falls on the ground and his eye falls out. And then that's the end of the fight. Julius also looks even more like a corpse now and his uncle accidentally pulls his arm off. Being a ghoul kinda sucks. Dr. Zeko tries to stake Max, but he misses. This is my stomach. This is my heart. You should know the rules, Zeko. Max pulls at the stake and tries to kill Dr. Zeko, but Rita stops him. He then grabs Rita and disappears. He also does the thing again where he creates a giant wind gust that blows out all the candles in the room. Fortunate for Rita's partner, Max only teleported like 15 feet away into the next room. Justice breaks down the door and finds a kind of hidden area with Max's coffin. He approaches the coffin and opens it, ready to stake Max, but Rita's the one inside, and their transformation is almost complete. This is when the final battle begins. Before it does, I want to do a quick rundown of Max's abilities. He's able to turn into a wolf, start fires, has a great healing ability, can fly, use mind control, take on others' appearance, manipulate the wind, manipulate electricity, turn people into ghouls, super strength, super speed, and can cast spells. As far as weaknesses, we know he can't go out in the sun, and holy objects burn him. Nothing is mentioned about silver or garlic. It seems the most effective way to kill a vampire is a stake to the heart. Other than that, they're almost unkillable. Max is able to send Justice flying through the air with one hit, and he can also move around the room so fast it's like teleportation. Clearly, Justice is no match for a vampire. It's possible Max is stronger when in his full vampire form. Justice puts up a good fight, but is knocked to the ground by Max. He kicks away the special dagger and tells Rita to feed. Just when it looks like she's about to succumb to the curse, she grabs the ancient stake and stabs Max in the heart, killing him. Max lets out a loud scream and says, I knew you were a killer, and then falls into his coffin. For a second, the camera zooms in on his ring. When he dies, he turns back into his normal self and then disappears. The entire building begins to shake like an earthquake and wind blows out all the windows. After Max is defeated, some kind of spirit bat flies out of his coffin and out the window into the sky. Is that like Max's soul moving on or something? Or does that mean he's still alive in some form? Max is finally defeated and this cures Rita of her vampirism. Similar to a lot of other vampire films, if you kill the sire before the first full moon, you can reverse the curse. Rita and Justice then live happily ever after. One thing that's kinda weird though is Julius still remains a ghoul with one eye and one arm. He does get to keep Max's limo though. Him and his uncle jump inside and he opens the sunroof and Max's ring falls into the limo. Julius puts it on and says, Max won't be needing this anymore. Then he starts shaking uncontrollably and there's a large puff of smoke. At first, I thought he was gonna turn back into a human, but he turns into a vampire. There must have been something magical about Max's ring. Maybe it has some kind of spell cast on it. I'm glad Julius finally got repaid for all of his hard work. There's a new vampire in Brooklyn, and his name is Julius Jones. I'm still not sure why Max couldn't have just made a new vampire, instead of having to track down Rita. The only thing I can think of is that the process of becoming a vampire is very difficult, or can only be done through reproduction, or a magic ring. It's also very mysterious why he needed to turn her before the next full moon. Max did say that one vampire is a doomed vampire. Maybe there's something about the curse that if there's only one vampire during a full moon, they will die. I also wonder if Max dropped his ring onto the limo somehow, knowing Julius would find it. Hey, hey, easy, easy, bro. Hey, now. These vampires lived in the Caribbean for centuries. There is a famous Caribbean creature known as the Sokuyant. They are thought to be vampires, often depicted as women, but there has been stories of the creature taking many shapes. They bite their victims and drain them of blood just like a normal vampire. Where they differ from a normal vampire is at night they shed their skin and appear like a ball of flame floating through the sky. The legend goes that they must store their skin suit somewhere safe and then put it back on in the morning or they will burn up in the sun. One way to kill the Soikuyant is to place grains of rice outside your home and it will feel the need to stop and count them all. Then when the sun rises, the creature will burn up. So you can trick the Soikuyant the same way Peter Griffin tricked James Woods. Ooh, a piece of candy. Ooh, a piece of candy. 
I'm surprised that the creators of the film didn't lean more into the Caribbean folklore, but I guess it does say that these vampires originated from Egypt. I still think it would have been really interesting to take inspiration from the legend of the Soikoyant. That's my video on the vampire in Brooklyn. I decided to cover something a little more lighthearted and I hope you all enjoyed. The movie got pretty bad reviews when it came out, but over the years people have really warmed up to this film and recognized how unique it is, becoming a certified cult classic. If you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend. I think Maximilian might be up there with one of the strongest vampires I've covered. If there's any other movies or TV shows you want me to cover, please leave them in the comments below. If you enjoyed, leave a like and subscribe if you haven't. It helps out a lot and I really appreciate it. As always, a big thanks to my members for supporting the channel. Roderick, Zothra's Paradox, Adam Okabe, Matthew Batson, Dragon Fay Rose, Emily Nixon, Onyx Cat, Walter Collin, Dominique Toussaint, Czar Shadow, Rich Sauce, Great Grebo, Nates in La La Land, Dark Tower 9595, Keegan McLaren, William Gutsko, Jason Miller, Gabriel Ragsdale, Steve Lloyd, Jake Walker, Awesome Pea Shooter, Cypher 2890, Mark Thorpe, Stephen 556, Owen Wildish, and Joseph Roman. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.